In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We continue in our series on dogma, according to the faith of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Um, this session will be on Christology. As we spoke last time, and uh, there is a great link and association between the Church answering the question, who is the Messiah, who is Christ, and the belief in the Trinity. So this session will focus more on the Christology, the science, the study of the person and the work of Christ. I want to start with some of the titles that's given to the Lord and the names. He is called Jesus. He is called Christ. He is called Lord. He is called Son of Man. He is called Son of God. And as well, he has three offices. The office of the High Prophet, the office of the High Priest, and the office of the King of Kings. Each of these offices, the three last offices that we mentioned, the Prophet, the Priest, and the King, is foreshadowed in the Old Testament and is fulfilled and perfected in the New Testament by Christ himself. Jesus is the eternal Son of God who became man, who taught us by his word and example, and who died for us on the cross, who was raised from the dead and now lives forever as God and man. The person of Jesus brings us into communion with the Holy Trinity. Through Jesus our Lord, we can come to share in the eternal exchange of love between Father and Son in the Spirit. And this is the grace of sonship that Jesus has bestowed upon us. So he came from heaven, according to the words of the midnight praise, to take what is ours and to give us what is his. What is ours? It's our sins. What is his is his eternal sonship to the Father. The story of Jesus' life begins in eternity. It doesn't begin as he was born of St. Mary or even uh, in the pregnancy, the divine pregnancy months. It was eternal from before time. That's where the Gospel of John begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As eternal Son of the Father, the Word was always with God in eternity. Since the Son fully shares in the divine nature of the Father, the Word was not only with God, the Word was God. The Son together with the Father and the Spirit is one God in the eternal communion of the three persons. The Son lives in eternity in the heart of the Father. The Son is the divine Word through whom and for whom the Word, the world with, was created. Let me just pause here to tell you about the songs of the church that highlights this point, the eternal beginning of the sun. The song of Kiak that we uh, keep repeating during communion, the refrain that says, uh, who was born of the Father before all ages, came down and took flesh from the Virgin. The church is waking us to the point that yes, we are waiting for the birth of Christ from St. Mary in Bethlehem, but we should never forget that his beginning is eternal. His coming out is from eternity. The Son is the divine word through whom and for whom the world was created. As it's written in John 1, 2, Colossians, Colossians 1, 16, Hebrews 1, 2. To make the fatherhood of God known is to make us into children of, of the Father. And so he, in his prayer to the Father in John 17, Christ said that I, he, he revealed the name of the Father to his disciples and to us as a church. And when he revealed the name, so the same love that the Father has for the Son will be in his disciples. To make the fatherhood of God known to, to make us into children of the Father, the divine Son was sent from the heart of the Father into the world to be born as man, in loving obedience to the Father, and out of love for us, the Divine Son humbled himself to share our humanity. 
The virgin birth shows the absolute initiative of God in the incarnation. Man does not save himself. We don't produce the Messiah or the Savior of mankind on our own through natural human procreation. Rather, it is God's doing. God intervenes in the genealogy of human history to give birth to the one who will bring about the salvation and perfection of humanity. Redemption is God's accomplishment, not ours. <coughs> That's why in the, the virginal birth, Christ is not a product of a husband and wife. He is a product of the work of the Holy Spirit in the virginal womb of St. Mary. Um, Jesus Christ also is of the same divine essence, substance or being as God the Father. He is all that is God. St. Athanasius said in the incarnation of the Word, what the Father is, the Son is. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal. The Father is almighty, the Son is almighty. On the same note, St. Gregory, the theologian, would say also, that every title belongs to the Father, belongs also to the Son, except one. The only thing that is not the Son is unbegotten. The Father is unbegotten. The Son is begotten from the Father. In the Creed, we, we call that eternally begotten of the Father, or begotten of the Father before all ages. It is not like human generation. Our salvation requires a Savior who is both divine and human. In Galatians, St. Paul insists, if Jesus was not divine, there would be no salvation for us. But we also need a human Savior who can pay, who can actually carry our humanity in Him and take our stand in the, on the suffering seat and also in the glorification. So Jesus is the mediator and the fullness of divine revelation. Therefore, incarnation refers to God becoming flesh, as in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Christ as the glory of God revealed in a human face, in the face of Jesus, we see God. By looking at his life and hearing his word, we come to know, we come to know who God is. In becoming man, Jesus does not only reveal God, he also brings God to humanity. Not only showing him, but he also brings him to us. Therefore, we can ask or we can think of four reasons for the incarnation. As stated in the creed, for us men, and for our salvation. This might mean four points. One, the incarnation of Christ became becoming man is to reconcile us to his Father so that we might know God love, God's love and his Holy Spirit. Two, to be our model of holiness. As he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Love one another as I have loved you we would have not been able to be like him until he revealed himself in the flesh and we saw what his love can do. <clears throat> Three, to make us partakers of divine nature. Four, to establish the church. Only in the light of the resurrection do we see Jesus' death as victory rather than defeat. Jesus is prefigured in a veiled manner in the Old Testament and made visible in the New Testament. Tradition provides a guide to reading the Old Testament in light of its fulfillment through the method of typology. The typology approach reads God's works of the Old Covenant as prefiguration of what he accomplished in fullness of time in the person of his incarnate son. So typology, it's a, a simile, a metaphor in the Old that is completely realized as fact and truth in the new. <clears throat> One of the examples is the Passover lamb. How through that, the blood of this lamb, death and destruction passed over the houses of the Israelites who sacrificed the lamb, as death and destruction would overpass those who believe in Christ 
and have communion with him. A specific point, which is uh, Jesus revealing to us the love of the Father and the glory of the Father as the only begotten Son. St. John says, And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of his Father, full of grace and truth. I think about this story as um, a simile, a metaphor, a type of the work of Christ in relationship to the glory of the Father. The story said, goes like that. It was a king at one point in history. <clears throat> and that king was known for his perfect characters, as perfect as can, can be for a human. He was the most just, most loving, most wise, most honorable and noble, most generous, and it goes on and on. Therefore, his kingdom was very orderly. He had the best economics, the strongest army, the best laws, and the, you can name it on and on, agriculture, buildings, everything. He had a rule for his people who loved him very much that he would not touch their free will. And he can do anything freely. And they had the greatest admiration for him. They called him father. And he called them children. Next to this country, there was a river. And across the river was the border for another country. And it was the difference between the two countries was like night and day. The other country had criminals. The king of that country was a murderer and a thief. And they had chaos. They had nothing to provide for their countrymen. They're hungry, poor, chaotic, disorganized, savage. There's nothing really there to uh, show or brag about. If the two neighbors had something, a conflict over, murder can happen to solve the issue. And if somebody, somebody saw something they like in another person's house, they would invade it and take it by force and maybe even kill the person if they resist them. And this was the character of this country. They coveted everything that a good country has, but they were so scared of the army, they couldn't come closer. One of their cunning counselors said, we can take the position of the country of the good king not by force, because we cannot really overcome the, the very orderly, strong army, but by cunning. They asked him, what are you going to do? He said, the king's weakness is his people. He has no other weakness. If we convince his people to go against his law, we might be able to get the stuff, the riches of that country. So they went and sent merchants and messengers and convinced the countrymen of the king to do things against his law. After they managed to do this, and quickly, they told them the following. Now you have acted against the, your king. Do you think he's going to ignore this? You know how your king is very just. You know how your king is very strong, and he hates, he hates all the law-breaking actions. The countrymen felt very insecure. The people of the good king started to be afraid, and they started to wonder what can they do, because they knew their king would have not, would have not tolerated the actions they had done. In that country, there is not really police stations. There is an army. There is no presence, because they didn't need any of that stuff. So when the enemy managed to get them to break the law, they convinced them they had no other choice but to leave the country, cross the border, cross the river, and go to their country and live there. 
and they took them in. They had prepared for them a camp to work like slaves, didn't feed them. They were in the most miserable condition. The king heard about it, and the courtiers of the king's palace saw him that night when he heard the news, when he knew that his country people, his children, as he called them, had been taken by the enemy. They said that he cried, which is something very surprising. They had not seen him in that status before. When the chief of his army heard the situation and, and understood it, he went to the king and said, My lord the king, it is very dear for me and it breaks my heart to see you crying. Give me leave and I will go and destroy this evil country and subdue her king and bring them all your children back to you and I will annihilate this country in one day. And the king looked at him and said, have they gone out of my country to the other country with their free will or they were taken by force? And the people, the courtiers said they, they were, went by their free will. They didn't really, were not forced. So the king said, I cannot do anything if they had done this with their free will. If I start doing something now, I'm going to change the fate of my country and it will be like the neighboring country. You will not be able to do anything for me, nor the army, nor anybody in this palace. I'll have to take care of it myself. That same night, the king took his family, the two noble princes, and he took them into his inner chamber and had a conversation. Nobody knew what was in that conversation. Early morning before sunrise, the, f the, the prince, the heir of the throne of the king came out of the palace and the guards saw him disguised in peasants clothes and he crossed the borders between the good country and the evil country and went through to the camp where his countrymen the subjects of his father was locked as he crossed the borders of the camp um, the the camp guards were surprised to see somebody coming on their own. And the head of the camp was reported that, the, that there was a new person coming to the camp without being forced or even um, threatened. So the head of the camp said, sure, let him in, but make sure that he falls into uh, one of the crimes against his king, so we assure his presence. Otherwise, it might be a problem. Entice him to do anything that would make the king angry with him or disappointed. They, of course, they didn't know that he was the son. And they had tried this a few times to let him buy their stuff, do something against the king. And he never was, they were never successful. Could not persuade the prince to do anything against his father. But they didn't know that he was the son of the father. Eventually, they left, left, left him alone for a while. The camp leaders were okay, happy, until one day they started to notice that the people of the camp, the exilees, are gathering around him. They were attracted to him. They would go wherever he goes. They would listen to every word that he would say. And it was very shocking and surprising to them, to the camp leaders. He didn't know the secret. There was a secret in this story that the prince had brought to them something new that was not there. You see, these exilees had a different image of the king, was made by their own fault. They had an image before of a loving father who is so willing to sacrifice anything for them. Now, the image was of a just king who would take revenge against them for breaking his law. But when this prince came, they've seen something familiar, something they knew, but long time ago, and they've forgotten about it. And that was, he reminded them of someone. Nobody knew who he was. 
but he definitely reminded them of their king, of their father, the way they knew, they knew him before. That's why they were so attracted to him. When this started to happen, the, king, the camp leaders got very anxious and they pressured more and more the prince to disobey the king, but they couldn't. At one point, they started to hear voices like, what's wrong with us going back? We should go back to our country. I don't believe that the king will be very angry with, with us. Maybe he will discipline us, but he will not stop loving us. Apparently, the hope is being rekindled, and they are going to change or break the plan. And all of this is because of the coming of the prince disguised. The camp leaders had no choice but to put this prince to death. The prince knew it. He gathered all his countrymen around him on one night, the night, that, the night of his death, and he told them, I'm here because of my father. I am the prince. I am your prince. And tomorrow, the camp, leader will, the camp leaders will lead me to my death. And this is exactly the plan of my father. Because you came here on your own, without force, I had to come and show you my father's image so you can go back on your own by your free will. But the cost of this will be my life. And I'm very happy to give it if that would lead you back to our country. Tomorrow an army will come after my death and conquer this land and utterly destroy it. We'll take you back to my father. Be ready. This story talks about, talk about the image of God, how uh, through the sin the image of God was changed. And Christ brought back this image. He is the image of the invisible God. St. John in his letter says this very much he said the one that we have seen the one what we have handled we have heard that the things the things that is revealed to us through him is that god is light and in him there is no darkness as if saint john had not known this before the coming of christ that the father is perfect light perfect love there is no darkness in him maybe the old testament had not brought anything close to this So in Hebrews we read, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. In Colossians, the sun is the image of the invisible father, the firstborn over all creation. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? So man is also created in the image of God. However, sin entered into his nature and tainted his, this image of God. In order to restore this image and to remind us of who we really are and to allow us to get to know God better, allowing us to form a relationship with him, the Son of God became incarnate as the perfect man, giving us a way to be restored. In Christ, we see everything in its perfection manifested in a human form. We see perfect love, mercy, and justice on the cross as Christ died to judge sin in the flesh and to conquer death his own, by his own death. He also showed perfect love for us as he died on the cross to raise us up with him. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us in Romans 5.8. We see perfect power as the only man who was able to subdue nature, sickness, death, and even give up his own spirit and take it back. We see perfect humility as he is praised by the cherubim and the seraphim. He also chose to be born in a manger in Bethlehem. He, does this, he, does, he chose disciples from all walks of life and turned a sinful Samaritan woman overnight into an evangelist. He showed us perfect compassion where he cared both for the spiritual and the physical needs of the people. After a long day talking about the things of the kingdom, he asks the disciples to give multitudes something to eat and provides food for 5,000 people. 
He associated with the lame, the broken, the, ch the child, the child, the children, the misfits, and the sinners, knowing that he is able to he to heal them and raise them up to their original image. Saint Athanasius says, "God became man so that man be might become God." So Jesus is the perfect image of the Father. Is one of his reasons for the incarnation, one of the four reasons. The next part. I have I have a few few minutes more to. Yeah. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. I mean, continue our dogmatic theology uh, course. It's a short course on the f creed and how we understand the statements of the creed from the fathers of the Church and the Bible. Last time we spoke about the reasons of the incarnation of Christ and who is Christ in his titles and names. A quick summary, Jesus is the name. The other title is Christ, Lord, um, he has the three offices of prophet, priest, high priest and king. He is the Son of Man and the Son of God. And we spoke about the four reasons of the Incarnation. And uh, the Incarnation happened because Jesus wanted us and, and the Father wanted us to know the Father through His Son, His perfect image. So to reconcile us to his Father, that's number one, so we might know God, love, and his Holy Spirit. To be our model of holiness, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. To make us partakers of divine nature and to establish the church. And we had this story about Jesus being the image of God the Father in the story of the good king and his son. Now we move on to the second part of the Christology lessons which is the heresies that had to face the church and the church had to come up with terminology and definitions and understanding of who Christ is to stand against these heresies. Heresy, the word heresy, as we said before, is literally translated uncommon, off the common path, something the church did not know or is not believed. It's contrary to what the church is believing or different than it. The common church. So let's go into the terminology, the terminologies. Incarnation refers to God becoming flesh. A Greek word, homoousios, means consubstantial or equal in the one nature. Essence is the same as nature or substance, the stuff. Hypostasis is a word in Greek that means the reality of something or someone. It's made to contradict or to counteract persona or mask, something to pretend. So hypostasis is the reality, not the pretense. Prosopon in Greek means person. In English can be understood as face or mask originally which is the same as persona in Latin. So prosopon is Greek, persona is Latin, and it's also a mask or face. Let's talk about something else that's called Christology of Descent. The Christology of Descent. The dogma of the Incarnation explained as the second divine person coming down from heaven and taking our humanity. It is in contrast with the Christology of Ascent which says that Christ was born a regular human, then was elevated to the divine status. So what, which one we believe? It's Christology of the descent. Christ was in heaven before coming down and becoming man. We believe that our Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, the incarnate Logos, is perfect in his divinity and perfect in his humanity. He made his humanity one with his divinity without mixture or mingling or confusion. His divinity was not separated from his humanity, even for a moment, nor a twinkling of an eye. At the same time, we anathematize the doctrines of both Nestorius and Eutychus, which is 
to say that we don't believe in the, uh, the dogma or the Christology of ascent, that he was born man and then he was uh, adopted as the son of God. What are the heresies? Um, the heresies and the heretics The first one we had said before is the docetics, from the Greek word dokiu, meaning to seem, believe in complete deity of Christ, fully God, but seemed to be human. These are the docetics. The Apollinarians, they believe in the divine nature of Christ, but do not believe in his complete human nature. They consider that human nature of Christ was not in need of a soul, a rational soul. And thus he was without soul because God the Logos provided the needed life. He has only divinity that animates the body, but no. So the Cedric said there is no body. Apollinarians said there is a body but no soul. United to the divinity. The Arians. The Arians denied the divinity of Christ. It's the opposite. Believed that Christ was not consubstantial with the Father, but he was created. So they call him a demigod, half god, or a lesser god of different nature, not exactly the same nature as the Father. Nestorians believed that St. Mary gave birth to a mere human and that divinity descended and filled this human. Thus the Virgin Mary would be called the mother of Jesus, Christotokos, and not the mother of God. St. Cyril insisted on the use of the Theotokos, mother of God, not for the sake of St. Mary actually, it is for the sake of the divinity of Christ, that Jesus was divine the divine word that came and took flesh from Mary. So she had to be called the mother of God. In doing this, it is considered that he denied the divinity of Christ by insisting on using Christotokos, the mother of Christ. Some people do this today when they insist on using the mother of Jesus, as the Gospels say, but the church had already confirmed the mother of Jesus is the mother of God, because Jesus is God. The last heresy in our series is Eutychianism. Eutychus was the man who started this idea. Eutychianism uh, opposed the Nestorian, trying very hard to fight the Nestorian. So Nestorians said we should never worship the child that was born of St. Mary, but we worship him later, maybe in baptism, after the divine came and abide or abode in him. Eutychian, Eutychian said no, Jesus was not this way. He was actually um, divine. He had no human nature almost, or the human nature was swallowed in the divine nature. So uh, in a way he denied his pain, suffering, thirst, hunger, etc. So you have the docetics. Jesus is completely divine, no human. Apollinarians, he has humanity but only body, no soul. The div divinity took, took the part of the soul. Arians denied denied the equality of the divinity with the Father or the same nature. The historians said he was born man, then he became God later. Eutychians said he had no human, uh, no humanity, that the humanity was swallowed in his divinity. There's another word that we need to also learn, the difference between Mephazite and Monophazite. So if somebody asks a Coptic Orthodox Christians, are you a Monophazite? We answer and say, I am a Mephazite. What is a Mephazite? It's composite nature versus single. Composite, made of two and in perfect unity. So it is a composite nature. That's a Mephazite. What are the reasons that for Christ's incarnation? We said that before. Um, there is a Coptic Church statement that was made um, by Pope Shunu III in 1973, it was a very, really exciting time and event between Pope Shunu III of Alexandria and Pope Paul IV, Paul, Paul VI of Rome. Their common declaration says about Christology, we confess that our Lord and God and Savior and King of us all, Jesus Christ is perfect God with respect to his divinity, perfect man with respect to his humanity. In him his divinity is united with his humanity in a real perfect union without mingling, without commixtion, 
without confusion, without alteration, without division, and without separation. That's almost taken from the confession of the priest in the Coptic liturgy of St. Basil. The conclusion, I conclude that term monophysites or monophysitism does not reflect the real belief of the Coptic Orthodox or the Armenian or the Syrian or the Ethiopian, or which, which is called the non-Chalcedonians. They prefer not to be called monophysites because it means they believe only in one nature. As far as the term may be misunderstood, it's, it's actually have bad connotation in history. They believe in one nature out of two, composite nature, one united nature, uh, or, or, or one incarnate nature, and not a single nature. There's a difference between the two. Single nature has a bad connotation. It gives a bad impression from history, because it, it goes into the Docetics and uh, Eutychianism. That's not what we believe. We actually, the church anathematized, excommunicated both these two beliefs, the two heresies of Docetics and of Eutychus. There is no evidence that the term was used during the fifth century. Most probably it was introduced later in a polemic way on behalf of the Chalcedonian churches. Somebody introduced it to label the non-Chalcedonian churches as heretical. However, Considering the past, the non-Chalcedonians, which are the churches of uh, the Copts, the Syrians, the Armenians, the Ethiopians, and the Indians, um, prefer to be called Miaphysites than Monophysites. Recently, insofar as they are coming to be understood correctly, they are to be called simply Orthodox, which is a very painful thing because the, some of the Chalcedonian churches will not agree to call Orthodox to the, to the non-Chalcedonians. The same belief with their brothers, the Chalcedonian Orthodox churches, this could be an eminent fruit of the unity of the Orthodox churches. Okay, so let's go into the councils quickly about the nature of Christ. So when the church was faced with the question, who is Christ. Who is Christ? And this question kept ringing in the ear of the church without a very definite answer until 325 in the Council of Nicaea. The reason for this question to be raised again is a priest from Alexandria, his name is Arius, a short thin man with curly hair, very bright eyes, and eloquent in his speech. He actually used to make songs to permeate or to, um, to propagate his theology. He said, in many places, it seems like Christ is not really God. To solve the issue of how can it be one God and three persons, he said, because Christ is not God. He is a God. As some believe that Jehovah's Witness was whole today. They translate the beginning of the Gospel of St. John into this, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. And other places where uh, it says he's the firstborn of all creation, and some other stuff like that from the, the gospel taken out of context without understanding to prove the point that Jesus was not equal with God. There was a big debate in the council in 325 and the Constantine called for a council because he started to feel that his empire is being torn apart with the new callings of Arius. And the, the, the bishops started to listen to him, and the, he wanted to have a resolution for this. He called all the bishops of the empire, the, the, the newly forged uh, empire under Constantine. When, he, when they met together, they met in a, in a city called Nicaea in Asia Minor. <coughs> and they had to decide what is the faith of the church they find. 300 out of the 318 bishops agreed and they said, we received from the apostles and their successors that Christ is to be worshiped and seen equal to God. St. Athanasius said, let us write it down he was a deacon at the time, going with Pope Alexandros 
from Alexandria. And he said, let's write it down, and the word he chose is homo osseus. Homo osseus meant one with God the Father in nature and equal, the equality in the one nature. So everything the Father has, the Son has, everything the Son has, the Father has. And that was the issue. While Arius and the Arians said, no, Christ is created, but he's created as a demigod, smaller god. The outcome of this debate in 325 in the first ecumenical council in Nicaea, that, that Christ is eternally God, and that was affirmed. And the, the result of that was the first part of the Nicene-Constantinople uh, uh, Creed. The Nicene, Const Nicene part of it was from we believe in one God all the way, and his kingdom shall have no end. And they stopped there. Now the church had affirmed that Christ is homo osseus with the Father. Homo osseus means, homo means equal, osseus means nature, the equality in nature. He is true God of true God. And, and that word was the biggest word that the Arians had to fight. After this was established and the creed was put together, the Arians fought very viciously against the church and they could manage to exile St. Athanasius multiple times. After this subsided a little bit, just temporarily, the thought came, okay, if Christ is fully God, how is he fully human? Um, and so they said, this could not be unless we think of two persons. How can be a fully God and fully human and yet one person? So Apollonarius, had to resolve this issue and he thought about, okay, he can be one person if only the divinity abides in a flesh that has no soul, no rational mind. So the council had to come back again in Constantinople and this time was 381 AD and the answer and the heroes of faith at that time was Gregory of Nazianzus, the, the theologian, Gregory of Nyssa, St. Basil the Great, the Great and they had to reconcile, had to, re, had to answer the question about the humanity of Christ. And they affirmed that Jesus had full soul, full human soul, based on the works of St. Athanasius. He said, what Christ had not assumed, if he didn't take a soul, would not be saved. So if Christ did not take our human soul, he cannot save our souls. He basically would have saved animals that has no human souls. So the first heresy in the Constantinople that had to be fought is the Apollinarian her heresy. There is the, the heresy that Christ's humanity did not have a soul. They affirmed the Nicene Creed. There is another group in Constantinople who had a problem with the Holy Spirit. They call, they call them the Pneumatokists. Pneumatokists, the enemies of the Holy Spirit. They denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit and they called them power of God. And the Constantinople Council affirmed the divinity of the Holy Spirit as a person and completed the Nicene Creed by saying, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. After that, to reconcile the ideas that God, Christ is fully human and fully divine, Nestorius came up with an idea. He said there had to be two persons almost in a marriage the divine person from heaven and the human person from St. Mary. And most probably the divine person came and joined the human person later, not before birth. He could not take in his mind that the divine person would come and live in the womb of St. Mary. He, he would say it's far f be it for Christ to be, for the divine person to be stuck in the womb for nine months. So he said, I will not worship the baby that was born of Mary. A council had to reconvene again, and this time is in Ephesus in Asia Minor, in 431 AD. And there represented the Coptic Church in Cyril of Alexandria. He was the one spearheading the answers to this heresy. He had written a very strong ten anathemas against the thought of the Nestorians. And he affirmed that Jesus is one person, although he is divine and human, 
but he is one person nonetheless. <coughs> the outcome of this council, the complete, affirm the complete date of Christ, affirm Nicene Creed, uh, and also the added the introduction to the creed. And this introduction says, um, um, it talks about the Theotokos as the mother of God. We magnify you, O mother of God, and we glorify you, the holy Theotokos. You have given birth to the Savior of the world. He came and saved our souls. So they insisted, and sincerely insisted on using Theotokos not to actually defend St. Mary's honor, but to defend the divinity of Christ before his birth, that he is divine being who came down, divine person who came down and, uh, and lived in the womb of St. Mary for nine months before he was born. So these are the three councils that the Coptic Church would, uh, would acknowledge. Now I want to talk about another council that we didn't participate in, and this was the, the problem and the, 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 the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And again about the nature of Christ, had a political background to it that actually led to it. Um, because of a person from Constantinople, he was a, an abbot of a monastery and a priest, his name was Eutychus. He tried to fight Nestorianism, and he was a very big proponent of Athanasius of Alexandria. So he said, Christ is tertium quid. What is tertium quid? It's a third nature. So when Christ's divinity came and united with his humanity, he became a third nature, unique, as different than divinity, different than humanity. It's a different nature, something very peculiar. And the church actually rejects that totally. When the, his patriarch excommunicated him because of his teaching and his aggressively teaching it in Constantinople. Uh, patriarch, his name was Flavian, in the time of Leo of Rome, Leo the Great. He cried and went and begged to be protected by the Alexandrian patriarch at the time, and it was Pope Dioscorus. When he went to Pope Dioscorus and he examined his beliefs, Apparently, uh, Eutychus claimed uh, to go back on his teachings, and Dioscorus had returned him from his um, excommunication, and he gave him back his rank as a priest. When Flavian of Constantinople heard of it, he asked to convene a council, and he considered it um, a transgression against him personally. And the council met in Chalcedon. You, Pope, uh, Patriarch Discorus, our Patriarch in Alexandria, was considered a heretic by agreeing to Eutychus. Uh, there was a lot of anger. Leo of Rome was away. He didn't actually come and attend the meeting. But immediately a series of excommunication happened between Discorus and Flavian and Leo. And it was a big mess, ended up by excommunicating the churches each other. So the East, um, so the Alexandrian and the Syrian who were together were excommunicated. I guess Armenian patriarch at the time was at war. There were, the country was at war and they couldn't um, be present. But they heard of the unfairness that happened toward the patriarch of Egypt and Syria and they sided with them. And nobody actually listened to the other to see if what is going on um, is a problem or it's really a miscommunication. They didn't even allow the Oscorus, according to our tradition, to enter into the council. The outcome of the Council of Chalcedon that they proclaim two natures of Christ, the human nature and divine nature, uh, which is a little bit upsetting to the, the, the Alexandrian church because of Saint Cyril who talked about the composite nature. Uh, it's a very fine definition of fine differences, but the, the, the result of all this is the split of the church into the Chalcedonian churches, non Chalcedonian churches. Chalcedonian churches including Rome, later on will split also, and Greece, Constantinople, Russia was not there yet at the time, and the East Europe. The non Chalcedonian would include the Copts, 
the Church of Alexandria, the Syrian, the Ossian Orthodox, the Armenian, and later would have the Ethiopian and Eritrean and Indian. Recent efforts of reconciliation recently were reviewing the minutes of the Council of Chalcedon, it was found that the differences were only in the language used to define the nature of Christ. The Chalcedonians insisted on using two natures of Christ, divine and human natures, but maintained the perfect unity of the two in one person. And the reason that they saw that the term one nature might hint to the tertium quid of Eutychus, that, that composite nature might mean different nature, is not divine, not human, something new. It doesn't have exactly the same characteristics of God and man, something very weird and peculiar. And because of this, they refused to use the, the, the miaphesis, uh, which is a composite nature. And so they were afraid of the Eutychian, Eutychian heresy that says uh, Jesus is, Christ is made of a tertium quid. The non chalcedonian insisted on using one nature out of two, and the reason that they saw that the term two natures might hint to the two persons in the Nestorian heresies. Because of their fear of different heresies, they, they stuck with what they th saw perfectly, the perfect definition. During the last century, especially in the second half, the dialogue between the Orthodox churches had resumed around the common heritage of faith regarding the nature of Christ. So they used to uh, depict to have the unity elements rather than the discordance unity. Conclusion. I conclude that the term monophysitism does not reflect the real belief. We talked about this before, that we prefer to use meophysites rather than monophysites as explaining, uh, describing us. And um, uh, it's prefer preferably actually altogether to say uh, orthodox as to hint or to say that we are part of this family of churches rather than excluding us and calling us monophysites, which is not something in history very agreeable, even to the cops themselves. Glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit.